Hello, everybody. Welcome to Axiom's follow-up about emerging health technology and temperature screening. I have got a couple of guests with me today that were here with us during our webinar last week. So I've got Dr. Scott Cherry. Dr. Scott Cherry is Axiom's chief medical officer. And I've also got Michael Green, the president of Athena Security. We had a, a great conversation last Thursday about emerging technology and how to think about a layered approach to the return to work process and, and bringing people back safely into the workplace. Um, so thanks for joining me again today, Dr. Cherry and Michael. Um, you wanna say hi to the, the team? Yes, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us again today on health uh, information technology and how we address COVID. Yeah, great to be here from Austin, Texas, um, here in our headquarters. Um, happy that I'm invited back to share again. Well, thank you both. We had a few questions that we didn't get to last week on our webinar. So we're going to go ahead and get in and dig into that. Um, so first up, our first question that came in, I'm just gonna pop that up here in a second. Question number one is from James. Are there CDC guidelines for on-site temperature screenings? Michael, you want to that? Uh, Michael, um, go first. Uh, sure, yeah, uh, happy to speak to that. So CDC has come out saying that uh, all, basically every single organization should be doing regular monitoring. And so employees should be doing um, their own initial self monitoring and it all should be under the supervision of their employer's occupational health program. So that's the guidance that the CDC is given and it's uh, intentionally vague, I think, so that every business uh, within different industries can interpret it uh, for their own vertical. Uh, so we have everything from food processors and food handlers, uh, and they are uh, following their own stricter set of guidelines, typically that their corporate that their corporate policy is coming out with, um, versus just the general vague guidelines. And more so, uh, FDA has come out with their own guidance on the specific devices. And so there's also some uh, FDA guidance, um, and uh, it's it's again there's a technical requirement to be under FDA uh, 510K. Um, you know it's doing no harm, and then for the thermographic uh, device guidance, it's a specific uh, technology requirement is that it has to be plus or minus within about 0.9 degrees, um, which is um, which is a lot of latitude. Um, so we're about 50% better uh, th than that. Um, so uh, yes, there there are guidelines out there, but they're still pretty vague for most companies. That's interesting. Thank you, um, Dr. Chair. Anything? Have you heard of any CDC requirements around temperature screenings? Yes. You know, I think uh, you know. Obviously, Michael had a really great response there, and and I think what I would just add is, you know, from a clinical perspective. I really appreciate um, the objective component of temperature screening by the employer. And so it, it provides an objective piece of information that will be part of a layered approach to protect the workforce. And so, um, you know, very early on, we've been advising our clients to do temperature screens. And uh, it's really good to see a systematic approach that um, Athena offers to provide um, efficiency as well as uh, consistency and the and reliability and in, and in, in the information being uh, screened okay thank you dr cherry so we also have a, a short video that we're going to play at this point um and the video i don't know if we can hear the sound but we may be able to have michael do some narrating and, and it's really a great video because it's going to show you exactly how the athena process works and, and providing accurate and safe temperature reading so i'll let michael kind of take it from there sure so this is john speaking at memorial herman hospital headquartered in houston it's one of the largest uh, not-for-profit hospitals in the state of texas they have about 8,000 people that come through this lobby way and they had two different lines and through each line they can process about up to about 2,000 people per hour because people don't have to stop. And so they're comparing this on screen right now with manual temperature taking and describing how we're saving them lots of money uh, because it's the efficiency, it's the time, uh, it moves a lot faster 
um, people don't have to stop as they go through. So this is for an initial triage of temperature taking. And so people, and that's actually me walking through. Uh, and so one sixteenth of a second, uh, it's giving a temperature and you can continually walk through. Uh, and that's a big differentiator in the marketplace to be able to do that at six to 15 feet. Um, Dr. Chang was also quoted in that, that clip also. Uh, and if people uh, wanna go back and see it, this is on YouTube. Um, and so Dr. Chang went through and he actually did a study of the Athena system versus their clinical grade contact thermometer. And he was really impressed with the results. Um, so we also have a, a write up on that that we can disseminate afterwards. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I think it's always helpful to see it. And, and I know behind you there in your office, you've got the, the cameras all set up too, right? Uh, that's right. Everyone's temperature checked uh, before they work in this building. That's great. We have a few more questions we're going to get to. Let's see, the next question came from Beth. Are there any privacy concerns I need to be aware of before taking temperatures of our employees? Michael, go ahead and take that one first, please. Sure, so it's the advice of most legal departments that instead of recording the actual temperature, you probably just wanna record if it's a high temp or normal. Um, so, we, we have that as a configurable option in our system, and you can actually change what that threshold is based on uh, whatever someone like Dr. Cherry, Cherry would suggest for you. Uh, so it's a configurable setting, and we can just record and keep high temperature or normal uh, against um, either a, a personal record, um, in which case you might have to save it for a while according to the law. Um, so we help you comply with whatever uh, your standard is and whatever policies you have. And and we've already built those configuration settings um, so that you can comply with everything from uh, if you're a covered entity under HIPAA or if you're uh, um, a company that um, has a maybe an insurance policy that suggests that you should store that. That's great. Um, any additional concerns you would see, Dr. Cherry? No, I concur with Michael. And you know, one thing that may be a nuanced here is if you have a, a third party um, occupational health provider, you know, then there's probably less of a concern about that information, but you still want to dig into how that information is being stored. Always when employee health data is being transmitted back to a, an employer, um, the privacy rules do take effect and um, a lot of times uh, there's this um, construct called minimum necessary information. So I agree with Michael that operationally you, you want um, the managers or those that are going to be um, managing who's going to be coming into work or screened out of work that they really kind of get a binary go, no go type of um a piece of information and that the actual um, temperature or symptoms would be uh, much more highly protected and, 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 and almost even partitioned off from the traditional business unit. That's a great point. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. Let's see our next question. We've got Nathan. How reliable are services like Athena's temperature screening? Go ahead and take that one, Michael. Uh, sure. Um, so if I, if I want to be a literalist and say how, how reliable this is, um, it's incredibly reliable. Uh, we have the data that proves it. Uh, if you measure our, um, if, if you want to chart this and use um, the standard deviation relative to the mean in terms of a statistical reliability, uh, it's been seen as very reliable. Um, so I, I don't know if that's answering the question, but uh, that's the very, very literal um, interpretation, I guess. Um, but we, we would see this as very reliable. Um, we also like the fact that this is a structured approach. It should be a camera that's mounted like this one uh, behind me. Um, and so you're gonna, everyone who walks into your building, it's a structured approach that everyone is, is temperature screening as they walked in, um, so it doesn't miss anybody. Um, so everyone has to go through that temperature scan zone uh, to get into your building. Wonderful. You know, one, one thing I would uh, add to it is, you know, I think the question was regarding technical reliability, which you can speak to, Michael. I think practically, I think also I would probably think about in the, in the along the lines of operational reliability. And so um, having having a technology and a, and a system that allows for this is 
is is very reliable compared to human testing and this is especially uh critical and obvious with large um amounts of employees coming in and out of the workforce or even um customers or cl you know clients and so a lot of our clients have very large workforce and so efficiency uh, along with reliability um, in the operational perspective is key. And so doing these manually can be quite burdensome, uh, probably in cost, but also in consistency. And so I, I really love the approach of a, a systematic technological solution to temperature screening because it's, it's every day, um, you know, for really the, the future. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that again. Uh, I've heard the word uh, just biosecurity, and this is part of the future where yeah. uh, now this is scanning for, and, and sure, we're under a pandemic uh, with a specific uh, use case right now for that. However, this is also um, used for all general health. And I think we're in an era where it's just, we don't, we don't want to be seated next to anyone who's coughing, sneezing, has a temperature. Um, it's just a no tolerance era right now. And so this is a way to just help present um, lots of disease or infection uh, into the building. And even though we can't prevent it all, uh, this is a, a step in the direction of, uh, we're gonna publicly uh, put this out as a systematic approach. It's part of that layered approach, uh, coupled with lots of other um, of your suggestions in the CDC's suggestions, so that we can just have a, a greater um, a greater comfort with everyone around us, as well as then it's just re-advertising the fact that there's a no tolerance policy for anyone who has symptoms. Those are really great points. Thank you both. I think we're at our last question. And the last question came from David. What are some alternatives to on-site temperature screenings that you've both seen? So I know that's the business you're in, Michael, but have you seen any alternatives to that besides the forehead temperatures? Yeah, and I guess there's uh, two main um, rather valid ways of going about that. So number one is uh, screen before you come to work. Uh, so just at home in the morning, um, oral thermometer in your mouth, and you record that. Um, and then the other valid way, um, you know, I even wear, it's, uh, it's an aura ring. Um, and so there's different wearable technologies that don't do, a, um, you know, aren't very accurate uh, in terms of temperature taking, but you wear it over time and it will spot the increase in temperature, spot the increase in relative temperature. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, Axiom has also partnered with some other wearable technology companies and um, are, are thinking through how to do this from, a, a as we've talked about, a multi-layered approach from individual temperature screenings on wrist all the way through, you know, using your screenings to verify those temperatures and, and different options like that. Um, Dr. Cherry, have you seen any others as well? So, you know, when COVID first started, uh, obviously we were you know, the country and, and uh, medicine and public health were really in the infancy of understanding COVID. And so early on, the CDC was allowing for even subjective temperatures for flagging positive for presumed COVID cases. And and so I think when you think through that, if you are feel, feeling feverish, it's very reasonable to um, not come into work and to seek uh, medical consultation you know, but the opposite isn't necessarily true. If you just feel fine subjectively, you know, um, having that at least temperature check at home, um, especially if you have a long commute or if you're gonna go on a, a journey, some of our clients have journey management where they're gonna be going an extensive distance. You really wanna do at least that personal screen before you engage with, um, a long commute, you know, multi-state or with a crew, so to speak. Um, but again, you know, there's this paradigm that has shifted from subjective fever, you know, subjective, um, how do you feel about your fever, you know, your, your body temperature to measuring yourself. Um, and so uh, again, it's not preferred, but you know, again, if you're not feeling well, that, that should be a key indicator to not leave the house and, and seek kind of a telehealth uh, consultation. Yeah, great points. Um, we did have a live question come through from Conrad. Um, he wanted to know what's the weather resistance for these types of systems? 
So um, would the effect of the act, would this affect the accuracy of the reader or do they need to be in a climate controlled environment? Michael? Sure, uh, so uh, this is built for indoor use and it's, it cannot be in direct sunlight. That goes for both ends of the system. So the infrared thermal lens can't be in direct sunlight uh, and the same with the subject. Um, and that would go with also heavily reflected light as well. If it's from the sun, it's, a, it's, it's just so powerful that even, uh, you know, ref strongly reflected uh, infrared from the sun might also be an issue. So uh, any kind of polished surface is also environmentally um, protect, uh, potentially uh, bouncing infrared around. So we definitely like to have a picture ahead of time of where someone wants to deploy this. And there's always an option for how to compensate for it. And so we have um, thermally neutral uh, backgrounds. Uh, I've seen people successfully deploy just an office wall panel. Uh, so there's lots of uh, options for a thermally neutral background in order to help uh, isolate um, from um, kind of all the bouncing around emitted um, thermal as well as then uh, just inside, uh, there's windproof uh, tents that people have deployed these in, um, pods, temperature controlled trailers. Um, so uh, lots of options. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I think that's exciting and, and a, a great option if we can come up with creative ways to get people's temperature screenings done consistently. So I don't think we have any other questions that came in. So I'm going to pause and, and see um, Dr. Cherry or Michael, do you have any Final words, um, Dr. Cherry. Um, you know, so COVID continues to evolve. We're starting to understand more about the symptoms and transmission and epidemiology on this. We still have more to learn. And so I think one thing that has remained um, one of the foundational aspects of a COVID pre, uh, prevention program would be, you know, temperature screening. So you really want to start considering that as part of your, um, uh, ex uh, well, what did the CDC recently talk about? It's uh, they, they were recommending, you know, companies now start looking at having a, um, uh, Darren, you may need to help me with this. It's a Respiratory Disease Exposure Control Plan. I think that's the acronym or the, the phrase, but you know, having a, a temperature screening strategy sh has been something that's been consistent across um, as we learn more about COVID and how to prevent it. So I'll just close on that. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. Michael? Sure, um, until there's uh, a more effective uh, treatment for the disease, um, Keeping, keeping and being able to isolate people and being able to trace individuals who are symptomatic remains an important cornerstone of reducing um, and reducing the effects of the pandemic, um, which are drastically affecting our country in really huge economic ways, um, which is rippling into people's mental health um, and all kinds of um, uh, other uh, unintended consequences of quarantine. So we wanna be able to help protect uh, the most vulnerable and we wanna help make uh, the workplace safe. Um, returning to work, I think is um, you know, part of uh, the social structure of um, our society. So uh, we just see that as something we wanna help empower. Um, so the combination of testing services like, like the Axia Medical case management, um, anyone who thinks they might have an issue, uh, talk about it. Um, and so we're, just excited to be a part of this big change in terms of uh, more awareness around public, uh, just public health as well as occupational health. And so we're, yeah, happy to happy to be working with you guys. Wonderful, we're excited about it too, and we'll start having some really exciting white papers and news to share as we go through this um, and and proof prove out all of what we're saying here. I think it's a, it's an exciting time and we will continue to have these great conversations. So thank you both for joining me. Um, and I did wanna mention our next webinar on next Thursday on the 16th, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, on July 16th, we will be doing a population health management webinar with Dr. Peter Matos and Dr. Cherry. So it'll be a, a really great one. So please join us again um, next week. If you ever have questions, just let us know. You can always reach out to us on at coronavirus at axiomllc.com and we will answer your questions in our next webinar.
Thank you all. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Dr. Cherry. Have a great day.